Welcome to the show. This is Liberty. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it very much. In this episode, we are going to take a look at science and psychedelics. We are specifically going to explore ayahuasca. And if you're not familiar with what ayahuasca is, it's a combination of two different plants that are traditionally found in the Amazonian area in Peru. And Basically, one of the plants contains a chemical called DMT, which is dimethyltryptamine, which is normally causes a psychedelic hallucination when uh, either smoked or, or taken in various other forms. It's, when it's consumed in its state with this plant, it normally doesn't have any physical effects because there are things in the gastrointestinal system of a human called monoamine oxidase. So the second plant that it's combined with is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which prevents the breakdown of the DMT and, and it allows it to express itself uninhibited. And, and here's a quote from the Wikipedia article on ayahuasca uh, pertaining to its effects. People who have consumed ayahuasca report having spiritual revelations regarding their purpose on earth, the true nature of the universe, as well as deep insight into how to be the best person they can possibly be. This is viewed by many as a spiritual awakening and what is often described as a rebirth. In addition, it is often reported that individuals feel they gain access to higher spiritual dimensions and make contact with various spiritual and extra-dimensional beings who can act as guides or healers. So that's a quote from the Wikipedia article. What we're going to take a look at today is a study that Dr. Charles Grobes did in 1993 when he went to Brazil. There is a church there, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this very well, Unio do Vegetal, which translates into Union of the Plants, and its initials are UDV, which is how most people will refer to it. So the church invited Dr. Grobe to do a study on some of the participants that, that take the ayahuasca in a ritual that they use. The church has the legal right to use ayahuasca, and it has since 1987. Basically what happened when Dr. Dr. Grobe and his associates showed up, they selected 15 people at random that use ayahuasca twice monthly and have for the last 10 years. They also selected 15 people that do not participate in the rituals to use as a base to contrast their findings with. The Prior to the session, they tested the personality and psychological state of the participants as well as testing their physical health. While they were on the ayahuasca, they tested their blood every 20 minutes and blood pressure. And afterwards, they conducted interviews with the subjects and basically recorded their, their life stories and how the ayahuasca had, had impacted them. Some of the results that they found in their study were, the, the psychological results were, most of the participants reported uh, metaphoric visions of their life being out of control while they were under the influence. This An example of this was one of the, the participants explained that they saw themselves in a canoe on a river and the river had turned into rapids and they were rapidly losing control and this was 
metaphoric of the the turmoil that their life was and and the problems that they were experiencing and they felt that if they hadn't made major life changes that they would eventually uh, cause themselves harm or possibly an early death uh, they also experienced extremely religious transformations um, these these life transforming effects they had been experiencing antisocial behavior beforehand that they they found in, in the results of these interviews that they did after afterwards the antisocial behavior stopped uh, they they had severe problems with their families uh, the family life improved after they began taking the ayahuasca and they were able to become productive members of society and it was the conclusion of the the Dr. Grobe and his associates that these people had actually become pillars of the community and transformed quite a bit. So overall, I think it's fair to say that it had a positive impact on their their psychological makeup and, and basically turned their lives around. Some of the physical results that were reported by the doctors there, they found that there were no harmful effects observed by the participants while they were under the influence of ayahuasca. They took blood samples uh, a month later after they asked the participants to refrain from doing ayahuasca. Some of the results from that were the blood platelets. They had increased density of serotonin transporters, and, and that's that's interesting for a few different reasons. An exact quote from Dr. Grobe regarding the blood platelets are, platelets are believed to be a, com a comparable model for the central nervous system. So what that says is they can take a look at the blood platelets, how they are affected, and and multiply that out to how it's affecting the central nervous system of the human body for the individual that they are taking a look at. So they found that there was an increased density of serotonin transponders, and increasing serotonin is is important it's it's responsible for feelings of well-being and is actually the targeted chemical in the brain when using pharmaceutical antidepressants the some of the drawbacks of the pharmaceuticals are they block serotonin uptake uh, making more available for the serotonin receivers this is You've probably heard of an SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That that's what this does basically. It makes more of the serotonin available to the receptors that that use it and turn it into these feelings of well-being. The problem with the pharmaceuticals is it causes a downregulation of the receptors. So while there's more serotonin available for the receptors, kind of the natural reaction to that is it cuts off the, it, it, it lowers the availability of the actual receptors. What they found in the blood platelets of the ayahuasca participants was it actually increases the amount of receptors. And though it doesn't necessarily make, block the, the uptake of the serotonin, making more of that available, what it does do is it increases the receptors, which is a more effective and more efficient use of the available serotonin. And this is all done naturally and non-toxic with the natural plant substance, the, the psychedelic ayahuasca. And I'll link the video of an interview that Dr. Grobe did where he explains this, uh, this study that they did and the, the information where I got most of the information for this show in the description of the video on the archive on YouTube. Now, I've been researching the use of psychedelics, the, the current scientific use in studies, and the way it's been used in, in ancient cultures and in modern societies that we probably deem um, primitive in different tribes and things like that. What's unfortunate is the war on drugs in recent times and, and an overall ban on plant medicines have... I think it's it's harmed our civilization by allowing psych psychological disorders to run rampant. And and the most ironic thing is these substances, the psychedelics, the plant medicines, 
are the least toxic and the most illegal substances that we are aware of in the Western world to, to treat these various illnesses. I've written an article on this on a website called lunaticoutpost.com. The article is called People Are Inherently Peaceful, Tyrannical Leaders Are Destructive, and I outline some of my findings in various forms of research that I've done on this, and I'd like to quote some of that article for you now. Humans in general are inherently peaceful towards one another. If they were not, we certainly would not have gotten as far as we have. The fact that we appear to be the pinnacle of the biological spectrum is evidenced by the many advantages we have over other species. For example, we are the only species that can turn ideas into material things. Some species can follow genetic programming, like bees creating a honeycomb, but we can shape nature into anything we can imagine. If we look for examples of people living peacefully, even in modern times, we need look no further than indigenous tribes in various locations. The Dagon tribe that live in the Burkina Faso in West Africa have no crime, no murder, no rape. For this from a society of roughly 100,000 people that live in seclusion and are considered backwards and uneducated by modern Western intellectuals. This is not the only example, but it does speak to the innate relationship humans have shared throughout the ages. Stories abound of ancient civilizations that, that performed human sacrifices and raids on other tribes with murderous intentions and to gather slaves. On closer examination, the cultures that existed before such extreme behavior is, most, is almost always a peaceful community that was harmoniously in step with nature. The change often occurs when influenced by leadership that's less interested in the needs of the people and more interested in maintaining control over its citizens and accruing more power. While one could argue that this is a defect of humans built into the psyche, I suggest it is more a result of untreated mental and emotional illnesses. What is built into the human psyche is the desire to maintain a peaceful coexistence with one another. The tyrant exploits this feature by using force to demand allegiance. It should seem obvious that if someone wishes to dominate another, it's done with force. The intent is that if someone does not submit, they will be harmed or killed. Faced with this decision, most humans would rather live than die, so it's not really a decision, more a reaction of self-preservation. I think we can agree that self-preservation is built into almost every human. That's the effect we see on a personal level. It can be observed on a societal level as well. A segment of the population will side with the tyrant to avoid a personal threat. Some still others will be critical of their fellow human beings that wish to challenge the tyrant and fear that it will result in punishment for others, themselves included, while not necessarily agreeing with the tyrant. These reactions are perturbations of natural processes influenced by tyrants with untreated mental and emotional illnesses. There are natural treatments for mental and emotional illnesses, which are usually outlawed immediately following the tyrant's rise to power. The tyrant likely knows intuitively that these treatments will affect their situation, and in fear of losing its perceived advantage over others, responds in self-preservation by rejecting the treatment, and usually preventing it from being available to anyone that might find value in it, effectively creating a system of propaganda that would consider the cure a poison as this is likely the way the tyrant sees the situation. This is an example of how ancient societies may have fallen from grace. This will translate into modern society by adjusting scale and technique based on innovations in technology. End quote. So, basically, through my research and observing the different studies that have been tested, testing the, the various psychedelics, it, it seems like these plant medicines are more than beneficial and it's very unfortunate that they've been banned and, and basically demonized because it's it's done more harm to our civilization than, than, than practically anything else that I can think of. We've been out of touch with nature and living destructive lives for a long time. If you look at the last three to five thousand years, this, that's excellent evidence of, of this theory. In some ways, it's gotten better, and in some ways, it's gotten worse, but the underlying problem still exists. Three to five thousand years might seem like a long time, but it's really a drop in the bucket compared to the 200,000 years or so that the humans have been walking upright. 
and I don't think it's always been this way, as we become more technically advanced, and I would argue less sophisticated in many ways, we're able to record our experiences in more permanent ways than we were able to, say, 50,000 years ago. And I think that much of that information, that the, the information that hasn't been destroyed by time, has certainly been locked up by various factions that have investments in maintaining our current worldview. What little evidence we have of from primitive cultures via the indigenous tribes that still practice the, the traditional customs, we see a stark contrast to the mental and emotional illness expressed in, in the modern world. And even what little problems that we do see in those tribes, it's difficult to know if that's they might be ex experiencing that from what little exposure they've had to us. It's, it's tough to wrap your head around to hold up the last 5,000 years or so as the extent of human endeavor on Earth is, is really short-sighted. Hopefully, through the work that Dr. Grobe and his associates are doing and MAPS, the maps.org, I'll link that in the video description as well, hopefully their work will, will be able to expand on the knowledge that we have through our scientific methods and, and make these substances more available to people who are interested in seeking treatment through that way. There's uh, other forms of psychedelics. You'll find these in almost every location. In South America, they have the ayahuasca. In North America, we have um, peyote and magic mushrooms, the psilocybin. In Africa, they have ibogaine, and the, the ibogaine has been specifically utilized to s stop certain addictions, for instance, heroin and other drugs, including cigarettes for that matter, and been very effective through single-use cures for these, for these uh, addictions. And we don't really have very effective means for, for, for treating these psychological and physiological disorders Mostly what we have available is psychological treatments, which consists of discussing your problems with a psychologist. You'll look at the various symptoms and try to explore what the root cause of the problems are and hopefully help the patient to uh, come to terms with whatever, maybe an abuse or some type of denial that's causing them to have these problems. If we look at uh, psychiatric, the model for treatments that we have in America, that's basically uh, you take a pharmaceutical drug that to treat something, and this isn't a cure by any stretch of the imagination because there's not much money in that. They'll, they'll give you a medication that will allow you to get through the day, and this can be very expensive because it's a daily, mostly a, like a daily pill that you have to take. Sometimes you have to take multiple pills in a day. The pharmaceuticals often have very harmful toxic side effects, and you'll have to take another medication to, to, to counteract that side effect, and that can only, you know, exponentially increase the cost of these treatments. And it's unfortunate that really the only medication that the FDA will allow for use of Americans are patented chemicals that the pharmaceutical companies have a monopoly on and, and the only thing that you can find that's going to ease some type of suffering or even make an attempt at a cure is very expensive and and is is out of touch for some of the people that really need it and that's that can be very destructive on a civilization when when cures and treatments are being capitalized on for their monetary value and the focus of the research that goes into various treatments and cures are motivated by how much money a company can make off of the the product once it's brought to market and that that directly affects the the plant medicines which are more or less illegal and in, in every case, when it comes to America, these are medicines that would be much less expensive that you could probably grow yourself that in 
other parts of the world, there are, are cultural systems that support this, so you wouldn't be taking something alone in your bedroom and not knowing, if, you know, what you're going to experience and not how how to integrate the experience afterwards. If these plants were legal in America, we could develop a culture in much the same way as we find in the indigenous cultures in other parts of the world. So hopefully by spreading this information and educating ourselves, we'll be able to expand the understanding of of what these the, the value of these plants and the value of the studies that Dr. Charles Grobe are involved in and maps.org and Dennis McKenna and make these treatments more widely available. I think that'll go a long way to to healing much of our damaged civilization and making the world a better place for everyone involved. I'd certainly like it to be um, a nicer place f- for my children when they grow up, and I'm sure you would too. I appreciate you very much for listening. This is Liberty. This is the Liberty Live Show. I suggest checking out lunaticoutpost.com and I will see you next week and we'll talk at you later.